uh, this morning for scripture reading. If you can stand for the reading of God's word, I would, I would encourage you to do that. If you can't, that's okay too. Uh, but we're going to be reading from 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, and we're going to be starting at verse 12. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. And this is one of two passages we're going to look at uh, this morning, a little bit later. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. To Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying out of hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And in a day and age uh, that have been, uh, certainly over this last year and a half, have been so very difficult and challenging, as I can imagine in this church, but also in each uh, household and each, each community, uh, each one handling things a little bit differently. And to see that change... Um, can be disheartening, and yet we know that your word does not change, that you, Heavenly Father, do not change. And so we praise you for that. As the world around, around us changes little by little, and sometimes big moments by big moments, Lord, we thank you for how your foundation remains steadfast. So we just give you this day, Lord. May we be reminded of that, that you, although the world is changing, never change. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, just to introduce myself, it's been a few years since I've been out here. Uh, my name is Matt Amundsen, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Grace Gospel Fellowship. Uh, we uh, regularly attend uh, Celebration Bible Church in Granville with Pastor Jim Shamaria. My son's with me today. you got Jeremiah and mm. Levi. Uh, Jeremiah just graduated from Unity Christian and is heading off to the Marines here soon. Uh, Levi uh, is going to be a sophomore at West Ottawa High School. Funny thing about Jeremiah, and this isn't going to put him on a spot, but he actually graduated from two high schools. I uh, didn't know this was possible. He graduated from Unity Christian. And then I had been getting emails uh, just the last number of months talking about senior night at West Ottawa High School. Now, he's never stepped foot at West Ottawa, but... Uh, he was in the graduation program and everything. So I don't know how many people have graduated from two high schools. There was a little bit of a, he goes to the tech center for Ottawa County, and so there was a little bit of a snafu there. But he did say to me, he's like, Dad, wait, wait, wait. You are telling me that I could have skipped out on four years at Unity and just, you know, walked at West Ottawa, got my diploma, and been on my way. I'm saying, well, it probably wouldn't have quite worked that way. Uh, my wife, Sharon, and my daughter, Kamea, are at uh, Celebration this morning. Uh, and they give their greeting as well. So it's just uh, just a real treasure to be here, to be able to share from God's Word and incorporate a little bit of an update on what is going on in the Grace Gospel Fellowship. I want to thank you as a church for faithfully supporting uh, the ministry of the Grace Gospel Fellowship. We have about 110 churches that uh, we partner with and about 220 pastors uh, across the country, both retired, currently involved, and that's what I want to share with you this morning. Just some highlights. You know, sometimes we think when it comes to preparing pastors, and they see that as one of the things that the Grace Gospel Fellowship is, is you know, kind of given the task of doing. We think of that person being young. I came out of Berean uh, Bible Church in Seattle, or now Shoreline, and that was uh, really instilled in us from an early age uh, I think about those that went to Grace Bible College to be pastors and youth pastors and other ministry leaders. That was instilled in us. And so sometimes we think that that is something that is for the young people. Okay, They're 18 to 24, uh, and they're going to be preparing to head out into ministry. Well, I don't know if you remember when, uh, you, know, when you were 18 to 24, you're probably a little less uh, mature 
than you are today. Is that correct? So yeah. I see a few nods of head, but I think that goes without without saying. Now we can become stubborn as time goes on uh, in our older age, but at the same time, I think we know a little bit more than we did when we were coming out of high school. And so we have many pastors stepping into, many men uh, stepping into the pastorate that might not be 24 years old. They might be 64 years old or, or 44. And some of our retired pastors, you have Pastor Craig Apel that's going to be coming next week. That's great to see both he and Joe Johnson are actively involved at, at Parkside Bible Church in Holland, which is where I served before coming into this position. And I know that, uh, that Jared you know, treasures that time and that connection uh, with Pastor Gary Spikerman and the church at Parkside. So that's encouraging to see. Craig is an example of one who has retired from full-time ministry, and yet, you know, as you, as you know, when you say, oh, I'm going to retire, do we really retire? And sometimes, in some ways, we stay busier than we were before. Uh, and Craig is one of those. Uh, he's stepped into many pastoral opportunities. So I want to share kind of the spectrum. And we're going to get into God's Word. We're going to look at, at a passage in Titus chapter 2 uh, and also look a little bit deeper into 1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, but let's just uh, kind of focus things around prayer to start. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you for... The scriptures. We thank you for your word that you breathed. What a uh, reminder, uh, what a confidence that we can have that what we are reading are your words. That there is truth. No matter what the world says, that maybe truth is this for you and that for somebody else, but we stand firm on your word your unchanging truth. So Lord, as we open your word, as we uh, share some of these testimonies from around the country, Lord, that you would be glorified and that you would um, just allow the harvest to be exponentially growing. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to tell you about two young men. Uh, and the last name of one of them you might uh, be familiar with. Uh, the young man's name is Ben Lorenz. His dad, Brian, was a youth pastor in the Grace Gospel Fellowship for many years, most recently at Rush Creek. But Ben is a senior at Grace Christian University and heading into pastoral ministry. Not many years ago, and, and actually not many months ago, he was talking about wanting to go into missions. Uh, he's even dating a Bephus. And if you know the Bephus name, the you know, they're a family of 460 living in Costa Rica. It's not that many. I like to I like to be to exaggerate once in a while, but they're a large family that's that's grown in you know Costa Rica, and their kids are involved in ministry. And so you'd think, man, we're, they're definitely heading towards missions. Well, the Lord has really been leading Ben to think about pastoral ministry, and he came to me and wanted more of an opportunity. He actually talked to Don Tenhove at Grace Ministries International, uh, Pastor Gary Spikerman at Parkside Bible Church in Holland. He said, you know, you really should think about this opportunity at Grace Bible Church in Anaheim, California. Now, we're working with this church, and they're a church that is, has a rich history, as, just as this church has a rich history. And yet, maybe fallen on hard times, and, and people have walked away. And we are looking to partner with them, just as we would be looking to partner with you as well. We certainly want to have this opportunity for others in our fellowship. A lot of times when you think about filling the pulpit, do you think about necessarily having a 22-year-old? If you say, well, I know I've got this seasoned guy, just like Craig's coming next week, or I can have a 22-year-old. A lot of times we're not thinking about that. You know, Who knows what that 22-year-old might say from the pulpit? You know, we looked at this and said, this is an opportunity. We've been sending interim pastors now for, for the last few months. John Lauder, the second one, Cal Bedoich. Maybe that name does not ring a bell. But Cal had kind of a rough ending at his, uh, at his church. Just kind of, it was, a, it was difficult uh, at Grace Bible Church in Port Orchard, Washington. And he really thought that his time, he said in an email, he said, I thought my time with the Grace Gospel Fellowship had dried up. I thought those opportunities were not there for me, primarily because of my age. 
And, and so he plugged in for three weeks serving and preaching and shepherding the flock at Grace Bible Church in Anaheim. And he's felt rejuvenated. And so you take somebody like Cal, who is, uh, Cal's about mid, low to mid 70s. I'm not talking about the weather here. Let's just say that differently. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of guys in that, in that time frame that think, you know what, we're kind of put out to pasture. No longer, they didn't want the young guys. They, you know, they want the 30-somethings and the 40-somethings. They don't want what I have to bring to the table. And yet, everybody has gifts and skills, experiences that Cal's been through that Ben hasn't been through. But there's something about Ben, there's something that, that youthful excitement. Can you remember the times when there was children and youth coming through and you might, you know, through this church? Maybe you can remember certain sounds. I, I can remember a church in Colorado, it, it, the leaders there said, we can remember when there was 125 people and we remember the sounds coming from the nursery. They miss those sounds. Sometimes we don't miss those sounds. Sometimes somebody's running through the church and we're like, whose children are those? Uh, you know, and you just, but there's something about children and youthfulness that brings energy and excitement to a family, to a church family. Ben is uh, now in his second, he's preaching this morning, in fact, at Grace Bible Church in Anaheim. And he has done a great job. Perfect, I'm sure not. But that's one way for us to get involved, for us to plug into our young pastors, to partner with Grace Christian University, to partner with Grace Bible Church of Anaheim, to partner with Ben. We don't just see his opportunities now, but we see the opportunities he has in the future, and we want to come alongside him. You can be praying for Ben as he wraps up his time out there. Troy Sergi. Troy graduated from Grace Christian University last year. He came from a Lutheran church up in the UP, had never heard mid-Acts dispensational theology before he came to Grace Christian University. And yet, just a couple weeks ago, for licensing and ordination uh, to be, become a GGF licensed pastor, Troy was one of the highest scoring uh, participants. And you go through areas of biblical theology, dispensational theology, and practical theology. And so his mentoring at Grace Christian University, his mentoring in the position he's in now, he's, in a, he's our first GGF resident. I think what happened in the past is that when somebody left Grace Christian University, we so quickly push them into a position. It's like, uh, we have 15 churches that need pastors, so we need to uh, plug them over here. Not really thinking about what's best for him, what's best even for the church. And so we want to come alongside of Troy. And so he is in a one-year residency that has just been extended to two years at Grace Gospel Church in Ada, Ohio. That gives him a foundation for the future. He's currently serving a month in Alabama, helping the churches down there, uh, working with Southern Grace Youth Camp, getting all these different experiences to bring a well-seasoned pastor. Not just one that can stand in the pulpit, but one that can interact with teenagers, one that can interact with children and families. These are two men that we have decided to come alongside of. And we want there to be other men in the pastorate, other men and women that come into ministry. Uh, we want to come alongside of. So we see that importance at such a young age and at the also for those that are in their 60s and 70s to say, you know what, we value you. Here's one thing that I'm going to say about this last year and a half that I'm not sure that we're talking much about. Uh, there's obviously been a lot of conversations. You've been a part of a lot of conversations when it comes to masks. Uh, there was racial tension that is still there. 
But one thing that I have been maybe most offended by is the age discrimination. You know, COVID certainly impacts the older generation and the really young that might be more susceptible. And yet I hear over and over, well, it's just, it's just old people. You know, their, their life is five years, ten years, six months. And I just, I struggle with that big time. I just don't understand why we show such reverence for, I understand why we show reverence for the unborn child. But God values all of life from the time of conception to the time that we take our very last breath. Sometimes we put value on youth or we put value on almost like a, a perfect age group because we, we kind of don't really count on youth until they're 18 and even then it's like, well, they're adults, but come on. Um, and then they reach an age where they're, ah, they're not really doing much with work. God values all of life. God values your life. And whether you have two minutes until your last breath or 60 years, God has a plan for you. That's been maybe one of the most discouraging things through the last year and a half is just to see the carelessness that society has and even at some believers have for the older generation, for those that are maybe more susceptible. I share that because I think sometimes we think, you know, we kind of focus in on this passage like First Timothy, and if you'd turn there with me, that'd be great. We're also going to go to Titus chapter 2. One thing that does go with time is, is eyesight. And I notice I foolishly grab a small Bible to try to read. But it is the one I read, so if, um, if you notice I squint, it's just uh, my eyes are a little different at 47 than they were at 27, and I'm sure they'll be different at 67. So um, but let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 11. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. <coughs> Sometimes we can could, we could look at this and say, well, in, and this is written to Timothy from Paul. We understand that. <clears throat> but I think there's much to be gleaned from this. That This isn't just about teenagers. Don't, look at, don't let anybody look down on you because of your age. This doesn't mean that you reach a certain age and this passage no longer applies to my life. <coughs> that faithfulness. Set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Those areas of integrity. And that's something for all of us. That's not just something for the young. Uh, turn with me to Titus chapter 2. I think this is really important. Um, that we not see 
the responsibility of developing others as somebody else's job. One of the most common complaints that I hear around the country is usually uh, directed at Grace Christian University. Why are we not producing, or why is the university not producing more pastors, more CE directors, more youth pastors, more worship leaders? Why aren't they? And certainly the university is part of that responsibility. But the Grace Gospel Fellowship is part of that responsibility. Georgetown Grace is part of that responsibility. Titus chapter 2, I'm just going to read a few verses as we start in verse 1. Uh, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands so that, that no one will malign the word of God. Now we could easily spend time on verse 5 there, and I, I think if we did that in each church, we might have a different response as, as far as be subject to the husbands. Um, but I, I really want to focus in on the fact that all people are involved in this. Younger are teaching, or older are teaching younger, that we are to be reaching into the lives of others. It doesn't just stop when we reach a certain age. You may look around and say, well, there's not that many young people in our church. How am I going to do that? Now, I know this is on, on YouTube, so maybe this is going to throw things off a little bit, but I want to I ask you a question that I'd love some response on. And I'll kind of uh, reiterate it so those that are that are joining on, on uh, you know, they can hear some of those answers. If you step outside these four walls, what is one way that you can teach others, that you can mentor, disciple? I'd love to hear some of those some of those answers. They don't have to be complicated. It's it doesn't have to be that this is a, you know. Bible Education Institute, uh, something elaborate. What are some ways that you could, or maybe currently are doing, to impact the lives of others? You can just you can just speak it out. If that would be great, and I'll just so others can hear. Um, what are some ways that you can, or are currently doing, mentoring, discipling, encouraging others? plugging into? Through friendship. Okay, through friendships? Great. Uh, in what way? Just sharing time with them. General conversations and that, opportunities come up to share the gospel or okay. things of that nature. Great. So normal everyday opportunities. Might be over a cup of coffee, might be the neighbor next door. Okay. That's an everyday, you know, sometimes we think it's got to be like it, it looks like on Sunday morning, and we can't, we can't recreate that the other six days a week. So we go to work. We are in our families. That's great, you know, those, through those friendships. That's the most common way. What are some other examples, some things that you've done or would like to do? To smile at people. Hmm. That that brings up yeah. That brings up a story, uh, and I'm glad you said that because sometimes we think it, it needs to be something bigger, and yet a smile. I was at uh, a men's conference in New Jersey, and I was talking to a lady there that worked at the office at this at this campgrounds, and uh, we got talking about some of the current issues that are going on today, and she was talking about how her son uh, was in a gay lifestyle. And he had come to her and said, you know, for Thanksgiving, I'd like to bring my boyfriend over. And she said, I mean, her first inclination was, no way. I, I 
can't do this. So she talked to her husband, and they had quite a time of prayer over that. And they said they, they wanted to keep the door open in their friendship, and their relationship. So they allowed them to come over. But she said her main goal, she said, I don't even know, Lord, what to do. I don't know what to say, but my goal is to smile. She said they had a good time. You know, there, there was awkwardness there. There was, there was some difficulty. And, and But it was just a couple weeks later, the relationship that her son had fell apart. But she said, you know, that looking back on Thanksgiving, I can't remember the, the young man's name, but it's like, he just really appreciated your smile. It's a simple thing. And we don't know how that's going to impact people's lives. Having friendships, that relational piece, very every day. Smiles. And this last year and a half, I don't know how many times I've smiled. I mean, I probably not as many times as I should. And yet you know what joy that brings to other people's lives. It's like it's it's okay to smile. <laughs> Even in the midst of hardship. Mayor, thank you for, for sharing that. Do we have maybe a, a couple other examples? Um, I think we probably all do, but it's it's important for us to hear each other. Um, maybe some ways that, that we're involved. And that might encourage somebody else to do something very similar. So maybe just a couple more examples. And I'm okay with silence, so if it gets awkward, I'll just listening. Yeah. Listening. Yeah. Listening is a it's a lost art, um, especially in the, the climate that has been the last year and a half. A lot of talking, not a lot of listening. So that's so important to know that people care enough to hear what we're saying. Maybe one other. Be a good example. Hmm. Actions, okay. not words. Okay. What would be an, what would be an example of being a good example that you can maybe from your life or when you're with people, be consistent that your hmm. actions reflect your beliefs and don't just go along with the crowd. Don't let your actions be different than the words that you say. That's a tough one. I know for myself. Great. Any others? I know some of you are probably just like, I hope he doesn't call on me. I hope he doesn't call on me. I remember uh, wanting to sit in the back and, and not have to, you know, be in class and be called upon. So uh, I, I remember those those uneasy moments. But you're you're in your mind and your heart. You know what some of those things are. Maybe this week or even after church ends today, you're able to share some of those things uh, just to be an encouragement. When I think of these two young men that I mentioned, Ben and Troy, uh, it was certainly the leading of the Lord that brought about where they are today and where they're going. But it, the Lord uses people in our lives. And I know you can, you're probably thinking even in your own life, what are some of those, you know, who are those two, three, five people that have invested in my life? I wouldn't be where I am today had it not been for certain people. My youth pastor, my golf coach, uh, different people plugging into my life. I remember, I don't know if this was a mandate at our church in Seattle, but I had many older men come to me and just strike up a relationship. It wasn't like, you know, I'd like you to read scripture this Sunday. It was, how are you doing? How's school? Uh, investing in my life. And they were 50 years older than me. I didn't expect it. But it's people plugging into. You never know what impact you're going to have. It could be a simple word. It could be a smile. It could be the fact that you just simply listened when they were at a very low point. Or not, not a low point. That example that you set that sometimes we don't realize impacts others. You know, we all have a part. For Troy, it took three, four, five men coming into his life 
to be an example, to speak truth. It's not just a one-person job. And sometimes we think we've got to be the whole thing. We've got to plant the seed, we've got to water the seed, and we've got to harvest. Well, the harvest is God's. Maybe you will be that person that simply waters it. Maybe you'll be that person that provides a smile, that encourages along the way. There may not be many young people right here today, but there's young people in your life, grandkids, nieces and nephews, that you can encourage. Whether it's into full-time ministry or not, maybe it's just simply stepping up and going on a mission trip, stepping up and encouraging a friend that's going through difficult times. Let me go back to that Titus chapter 2. Verse 2, teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. You can take that verse and you can say, well, that's to the older men. I don't have to worry about it if I'm a lady or if I'm younger. Or any. God's word is here for a reason. To be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. Self-control. Is that is that a phrase or a word that we've, we've used a lot the last year and a half? Probably not. Maybe one way that you can encourage others is... If you're on social media, if you have a Facebook account, or maybe you're texting, or maybe you're emailing, or the old style of social media, which is to send a postcard, to send a written letter. Can you think of the last time that you wrote a letter? Maybe for some of you that was just last week. I love receiving written letters, so I like to write postcards. And that can be a great encouragement. You play a role, no matter what age you are. God values you right where you're at. And you have something to offer somebody. Let's not sit on our hands. Let's not look at and say, that's somebody else's responsibility, or i got too much going on to do that. I look at the men that are involved from the Ben Lorenz of 22 for those younger men and women that are teenagers. That God can use them. God can use you right where you're at and all the points in between. This is, these are difficult times, and while certain mandates are going to go away on Tuesday, uh, we are forever changed. I'm just going to say that right now. There's not... You know, we all want to say, can we just go back to the way it was? <clears throat> Thing is, we've been saying that for centuries. Every one of us has said, can we just go back to the way it was when I was a kid or even 10 years ago? I think the amazing thing about that is, yes, things have changed. You have seen, undoubtedly, in your years of life, immeasurable change. And yet God does not change. His word was true when it was breathed, just as it is today. And God wants to use you right where you're at. So this week, write a note. Smile. Be willing to take a few minutes and listen. Think about how your actions impact others. And think about those friendships and those relationships that you have. How can you invest into them? How can you encourage 
them. We're so thankful for your partnership with the Grace Gospel Fellowship. We're excited for what is going on around the country. These are these are hard times. It's only gotten harder. And yet God is providing. God is an amazing and powerful God. So I want to thank you for your prayers. Uh, and I know Frosty Hansen, every time I talk to him, uh, he just he misses being here in the States and ministering in churches. And I know that Georgetown Grace is one of those places that he misses and asks about. So if you have a chance to encourage him and Kathy, email or otherwise, they would love it. Imagine how isolated uh, being a missionary can feel in the most normal of times. And yet imagine for a moment being stuck in where they live uh, and not being able to get out very much. So I just I share that with you because sometimes we need little, little specific mo uh, notes to pray for. So I thank you for this morning. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer as we wrap up our time and, and uh, as we sing our closing hymn, our hymns. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> I thank you for each one here and their impact. Wherever they are driving back to, whether that's here in uh, the Hudsonville area, whether that's points north or east or south, maybe west, or just traveling mercies. But, Lord, you know who they come in contact with. And I pray that this afternoon, whether that's time spent with family, uh, friends, neighbors, maybe it's time later on in this week where, Lord, you're going to give them an opportunity for them to invest and to realize that those simple moments, the smile, maybe just the engaged eye contact, just letting people know that they're, they're important. Maybe it's just listening to what somebody has to say, some a pain and a struggle they're going through. Lord, I pray that you would give them that opportunity. I pray, Lord, that they would take that very opportunity. And maybe they don't know the words to say. Maybe they, maybe it's uncomfortable. And some moments in life are uncomfortable, but there's great growth that comes from discomfort. And so I pray, Lord, that you would give them the strength and the courage, that they would respond, that I would respond, Lord, for the opportunities you give me. We all play a role in the growth and development of somebody or several somebodies. And maybe we will be plant a seed, but maybe we will water. Lord, you bring the harvest. You bring that impact. But may we see that you value us, that we are important to you at any age, young, old, in between, that until we take our last breath, you will continue to use our faithfulness, above all because you have been faithful. In Jesus' name.